happy Gilmore Girls season to all who celebrate. I've seen every single episode of Gilmore Girls three times. Yes, I have devoted hours of my one wild and precious life to re-watching possibly the most frustrating mother-daughter dynamic show of all time. Hit like if you also watch Gilmore Girls every fall. And I love it. I also hate it. And I think many of us feel that way. One of the things that I love and hate so desperately about this show is how it talks about money and how it displays money. As a certified money nerd who also watches a ton of television, something that I am really, really obsessed with is how money is displayed in our media. Because more often than not, money is not at all discussed when it comes to explaining how characters live, how characters behave, how characters feel safe or unsafe. But that's not true in Gilmore Girls. Money is a central theme throughout the show. And I really appreciate that because very very few shows make money so central to their plot. Gilmore Girls is much more transparent than most shows about money and how it impacts the characters. But it's also deeply insane about money and it's very frustrating about money. So let's talk about it. And if you don't know me, I'm Cara Perez, certified money nerd, founder of Bravely Go. And if you are into talking about money, class, and sustainability, go ahead and give this video a thumbs up and hit subscribe because that's what we talk about here. Okay. Here is the show premise, and there's gonna be spoilers. The show has been off the air for years. I mean, it's been almost a decade since the reboot came out, so there are spoilers in this video. The premise of the show is Lorelai Gilmore grew up in Hartford, Connecticut with very wealthy parents. She grew up in the social elite and she hated it her entire life. She gets pregnant at 16 with her then boyfriend, Christopher Hayden, and runs away from home after her daughter, Rory, is born. Lorelai goes to work at an inn about 30 miles away from her parents and works her way up from maid to running the inn. She is the inn manager. Meanwhile, she and her daughter, Rory, have been living in this town, Stars Hollow, that's full of kooky characters and somehow affordable for her as a maid. And she and Rory are best friends. When the show starts, Lorelai is 32 and Rory is 16. Lorelai has a frosty relationship with her parents, whom she never liked, still in Hartford. And the show revolves around the relationship between all of the Gilmores. The show also revolves around how money plays out between the characters. Lorelai's parents, Richard and Emily, are very, very wealthy. Lorelai is presented as sort of a working class hero because she ran away from the that snooty elitist world and provided for herself. You know, she started as a maid, she worked her way up, she's not too good for hard work and she knows what it means to put in the hours. And now here she has this daughter, Rory, who is beautiful and gifted and special. I'm sorry, just like a quick aside, the whole show is just seven seasons of Rory being told by everybody she runs into how special she is, which is like, it's a topic for a whole other video, but <laughs> is very weird on rewatching. Um, and Rory doesn't really have to work because of Lorelai. Money is also a theme throughout the show and money is a tool for the characters to weaponize against each other, to advance plot stories, and to act as a hindrance. Lorelai's parents, Richard and Emily, are very, very wealthy. We never get an exact net worth, but they are depicted as having more money than they could ever need. They are also depicted as being snobs. They like being wealthy. They like being exclusive. They like judging other people for not having as much money as them. This turns Lorelai off. Lorelai thinks of herself as a woman of the people. She thinks of herself as normal, and she's always, throughout the entire series, talking about how she ran away from that world. Now, Lorelai raised Rory as a single mom, which the show talks about a lot, but what the show doesn't talk about is the actual finances of being a single parent. Now the show premiered in October 2000, so it wouldn't be fair to use 2024 statistics, so let's talk about single parents in 2000. In 2000, 11% of children were living with parents who had never been married, which is the situation for Rory, 15.6% of children lived with a divorced parent, and 1.2% lived with a parent who was widowed. 27% of children lived with one parent. The United States has been trending towards being a nation of single parent households for the last two decades. As of 2023, there are 10.2 million single parent households in the US. While three quarters of single mothers are working and most are working full time, those working full time have a typical annual income of $40,000. 
single mothers overall have a 28% poverty rate. Again, that's for 2023. The world has changed drastically since 2000, but I do think it's important to bring that up because the lifestyle that we see Lorelai and Rory living was unrealistic in 2000 and has only gotten more unrealistic since then. Because while money is one of the overarching themes of the show and wealth is openly displayed and openly discussed, low income or straight up poverty is never discussed. Even though it's alluded to throughout the series that Lorelai and Rory lived in poverty after Lorelai left her parents in Hartford and had to work as a maid at the Independence Inn. But we're never told how much money Lorelai was making, we're never told what her expenses were, we're never told if her parents helped her out at all in that time. And I think, much more interestingly, we are never told that Lorelai had federal help. We never get told if Lorelai was on food stamps, we never get told if Lorelai applied for SNAP or if she had any type of welfare benefit. The assumption is that she didn't. The viewer is led to believe that she did not have any help, that she bootstrapped her way from being a wealthy 16-year-old to being a poor 16-year-old to being a successful 32-year-old mother who owns her own house, runs her own inn, and has aspirations to start her own business. This leads us as the viewers to look at Lorelai as the good working class or a good poor person who is deserving of her success. This is very consistent with how we think about money and class in the United States. In the United States, if you ever talk to someone about uh, social welfare programs or just social programming in general, you will often hear the phrase, that's just a handout. This comes up a lot in the political discussion, but it also comes up a lot in interpersonal one-on-one -on -one discussions. Oh, it's just a handout. People just want a handout. Lorelai is shown to us as never having taken a handout until the very first episode of the show where she has to go back to her parents and ask them for money to pay for Chilton, the exclusive prep school that Rory has just been accepted to. Lorelai wants the best for Rory and Rory has aspirations of going to Harvard, the most exclusive college in the United States. Both Lorelai and Rory feel that Chilton is her best shot at getting into Harvard and Lorelai wants Rory to go, but she cannot afford the tuition. Which also, by the way, we never find out how much the tuition is. They never say on the show how much Chilton costs. So Lorelai is forced to go back to her estranged parents and ask for a loan. Hi, Dad. What is it? Christmas already? Lorelai was taking a business class at the college today and decided to drop in to see us. What business class? Well, she told us about it, dear, remember? No. This makes well, actually, I came here for a reason. Dad, would you mind sitting down for a minute? You need money. I have a situation. You need money. We just please let me get this out, okay? Um, Rory has been accepted to Chilton. Chilton? Oh, that's a wonderful school. It's only five minutes from here. Yeah, that's right. It, it is. She can start as early as Monday. Um, the, the problem is that they want me to put down an enrollment fee plus the first semester's tuition and I have to do that immediately or she loses her spot. So, you need money. Yeah. But it's not for me, it's for Rory. And I fully intend to pay you back every cent. I don't ask for favors, you know that. Oh yes, we know. I'll get the checkbook. <sighs> Thank you. <laughs> you have no idea. Thank you. On one condition. So close. Since we are now financially involved in your life, I want to be actively involved in your life. What does that mean, Mother? I want a weekly dinner. What? Friday nights, you and Rory will have dinner here. Mom. And you have to call us once a week to give us an update on her schooling and your life. That's it. That's the condition. If you agree, you come to dinner tomorrow night and leave here with a check. Otherwise, I'm sorry, we can't help you. I, I don't want her to know that I borrowed money from you. Can that just be between us? Does seven o'clock work for you? And this is the first time that we see Lorelai ask for a handout. And it's also the first time that we see money weaponized because Richard and Emily give Lorelai the money, but they do so with conditions. Lorelai agrees to this, even though this is truly her nightmare because she wants Rory to have 
every single opportunity in the world and her parents' money enable that opportunity. So this kind of conflict is very interesting because we see this exact scenario play out throughout the show where Richard and Emily weaponize money against Lorelai and Rory, but particularly against Lorelai. And I'm just gonna say at the top, maybe you can tell, I am not an Emily Gilmore stan. I'm not a Richard Gilmore stan. A lot of people talk about, oh, their character development, their character growth, which blows my mind because as we will discuss later, in literally the last episode of the season, Emily is weaponizing money against Lorelai. I just like, where is the character growth? Rant aside, it's interesting to me that we never get details around the low income period of Lorelai and Rory's life. And we never get details about how expensive things are that they are trying to buy. In another instance, Lorelai's house has termites and she needs to pay for a totally new foundation. She struggles to get a bank loan. No bank will give her a loan, presumably because she doesn't have good enough credit and she doesn't have enough assets. <sighs> enough. Oh, I've got computer screens feeling sorry for me. Jeez, how many places is that? Oh, honey, it's not the amount of places that turns you down that matters. It's the quality of the place that turns you down that matters. And when you've got Jacko's loans and stuff, not wanting your business, you know it's time to hang out with the Corys. Please don't go where you're going. I think they would say yes. You, of course they would say yes. And that yes would be followed by, okay, okay, enough already. My God, please stop. I'm Michelle. I've got nothing left to give. That's not true. That is completely true. Grandma and Grandpa would want to help. Rory, I went to my parents for you, for Chilton. Why? Because that was worth all the obligation. This is not. This is our home. Yes, and I'll find a way to fix it. But how? While Lorelai presents herself as very responsible and very together, she seemingly does not have enough in savings or assets to qualify for a bank loan. This forces her once again to go to her parents and Emily co-signs for a loan for Lorelai. And Lorelai, understandably has a kind of meltdown after they sign the paperwork saying, well, what's this gonna cost me, mom? What else do you want from me? We already have Friday night dinner, so what do you want? Like Saturday brunch? And Emily, for some reason, gets offended by this and is like, I just wanted to do something nice for my daughter. As if she hasn't already weaponized money against Lorelai. I mean, Lorelai brings up Friday night dinners because that was Emily's idea. She tethered her daughter to herself via money. Now the town that Lorelai takes Rory to is called Stars Hollow and the town and the characters who live in the town are a huge part of the series and a huge part of the reason that the series has retained such popularity. What I find very interesting is how money is discussed among the townspeople because Stars Hollow is depicted as a sleepy little Connecticut town where everybody knows each other. It's extremely walkable. It's affordable enough that Lorelai at some point in her journey from maid to inn manager was able to buy a house on her own as a single unmarried mom. And it's also a place that has every single store you could want. There's an ice cream shop, there's a bookstore, there's the library, there's Gypsy's Auto Shop, there is Al's Pancake World, there's Luke's Diner. I mean, there's everything that you could want in this town. But there are only rare mentions of how the people who live in Stars Hollow afford their life. For example, Suki and Jackson. Suki is Lorelai's best friend and business partner, and they're depicted as being fairly middle class. But Suki owns a home that Jackson moves into. We never find out how much Suki's house cost, how much she put down, or how she, as a working chef, notoriously not a high paying business, afforded that house in the first place. We never find out how much money Jackson's vegetable business makes and how he and Suki can afford their ultimately three children. Luke, Lorelai's main love interest and also the diner owner, I think is very interesting because Luke is depicted as low key wealthy. He's not flashy. He wears his backwards baseball cap. He wears his flannel, but throughout the series, he is shown as having any amount of money that he wants. Anytime Luke needs money, he has money. Luke never needs to ask for money from anyone else. Luke is able to give Lorelai a $30,000 loan, which we never see get paid back. Luke is also able to redesign and rebuild his apartment above the diner. He's able to expand it when Jess moves in. Luke just has money at his disposal, but we're never really told how profitable the diner is, and we're not really ever told how much money he has in savings. In fact, no Stars Hollow resident is ever shown as struggling financially except Lorelai. And every single person in Stars Hollow is presented as upper middle class or secretly wealthy. We have a patrons only video that is all about the money of the Stars Hollow residents. We go through all of the major characters in Stars Hollow and break down their financial life as displayed by the show. So if you are interested in that, 
definitely become a patron that is patron exclusive. It will never appear on the main channel. And exclusive bonus content is just one of the perks of becoming a patron, so find that link in the description. Now, since money is a theme throughout the show, and as it's something that pushes plot points forward, try saying that 10 times fast, um, there are several big money moments, and I wanna talk about that. The first is obviously episode one, Lorelai asking for Chilton money. This scene, every time I see it, I feel so badly for Lorelai. I feel so sad for her because we see Emily and Richard emotionally abuse Lorelai throughout the entire series. They never really stop emotionally abusing her, which again, we can discuss in the comments if you think they have character growth or not. But she has to go back to her parents for whom she has been estranged from for 16 years and ask them for a loan, which is a really difficult thing to do. And how has she met her parents manipulate her into spending time with them? I think this scene really goes to show the power that those with money have. If you are someone without money and you need money to do something in your life, whether it be pay for your kid's private school, pay for your health care, pay for your medical needs, pay for your own rent, whatever it is, you are at the mercy of the person or the institution who has the money. Lorelai in this scene is at the mercy of her parents. Anything her parents say to her, she will likely agree to because she needs the money. She has no economic power in this relationship and her parents know this and they use it against her. This big money moment is not only important for us as viewers, but it's important for Lorelai because this does not endear her to her parents. This makes her resent her parents more because in her mind, she's like, couldn't you just give me the money? You don't need it. You have more than enough money to do anything you want. Can't you just be cool for one second and just give me the money for your grandchild who I know you like better than me? And her parents are unable to meet that. <laughs> They're unable to meet that bar. Now I'm coming down very hard on Richard and Emily. So I'd like to take a second and look at this scene from their point of view. Their child ran away from home when she was 16 and took their only grandchild with her. She has maintained extreme distance from them in the last 16 years. And to their credit, they don't know why. In their mind and in their world, they wanted Lorelai to marry Christopher, Rory's dad, and then send Christopher to work in Richard's business while Lorelai would become the next iteration of Emily, a stay-at-home mother in a wealthy world. That's what they wanted for Lorelai, and that makes a lot of sense. That's a financially stable life. Christopher loves Lorelai. I don't think that's ever in question throughout the series. And that's their world. It makes sense to them, and it's a safe option. Lorelai never wanted that, and that's something that Emily and Richard never come to understand. They can't understand why Lorelai rejected them and their world so thoroughly, and they're hurt by that. So when Lorelai comes hat in hand asking for the Chilton money, they see this as an opportunity to not only spend time with Lorelai and Rory, but to hopefully introduce Lorelai back into their world. Another big money moment on the show is when Lorelai and Suki are in the process of opening up the Dragonfly Inn, their own inn where they are the owners and they run the inn on a day-to-day -day basis. And they are rebuilding this building like from the ground up. They have put in all their own savings. They have like begged borrowed and stolen to try and put as much money into this and they're still short on money. Lorelai has an absolute breakdown because she is running herself ragged trying to manage the um, construction at the inn, trying to manage the promotion of the inn. Suki has just had a baby and she's MIA and Lorelai and Rory have not been able to connect for a while so Lorelai is missing her best friend. In this scene Lorelai is sitting sobbing and she asks Luke for $30,000. Failing, and I, I can't handle it. I just spend every minute running around and working and thinking, and I thought I would have help, but Suki has Davy and Michelle has Celine, and I'm do, I can't do it all by myself. I don't even have time to see my kid in hell, forget see her, just even talk to her, and I miss her, and, and I sat there at my parents' house just listening to my grandmother basically call me a charity case and I, I couldn't even argue with her. I couldn't even say anything because I am. I'm running out of money and I don't know what to do about it. And I was gonna, I was gonna ask you for $30,000 at dinner tonight. That's how pathetic I am. 30,000, well, um, well, okay. I don't wanna I mean, talk about it now, I don't wanna. $30,000 is not a small amount of money. 
$30,000 is a down payment on a home, it's a brand new car, and in this case, it's enough money to get Suki and Lorelai over the finish line of being able to open their inn. And she asks Luke this in a fit of desperation, but also super casually. What I find really interesting is how did she know Luke had the money? There is a scene earlier where Suki's like, I mean, he's a hermit, and I'm paraphrasing here. You know, Luke's got money, he's a hermit. He doesn't do anything. And that is a good assumption, right? Like people who don't spend a lot of money, but have consistent jobs, have consistent income, they could have a lot of money. But we really don't know because Luke never talks about money. We as the viewer are never shown a scene of Luke and Lorelai talking about like the stock market or where they keep their savings. Hey, which savings account do you like? Oh, I have this HYSA that I use and I really enjoy. I get 6% interest. Yeah, that, that never happens, right? So Lorelai really should not have any understanding of how much money Luke has. She really shouldn't know if he has that money or not. And I also think it's an interesting dynamic of friends borrowing money. Luke gives Lorelai the money. Spoiler, he gives Lorelai the money. And oh you make me nervous. Just, uh, here. What's this? It's what it is. A monk, a trunk, and a skunk. What are you doing? Karnak, although I don't have a punchline. Never stop Johnny. Put that down. Hide it. What is it? Open it later. <sighs> a check to me for $30,000. Look, this is the money I was going to ask you for. And you did ask, and there it is. But I didn't. Not officially. I blubbered an amount to you, and I, we didn't get to talk about a repayment schedule. It's okay. Or interest or collateral. I had charts and projections. I wanted to take you out to a nice dinner. So send me a honey bag tan. But this is wrong. This is not how you do these things. I don't know how to do these things. Will you just take the money? I'm sorry. You at least have to go over the basics. I don't want to read that. Well, I'm not leaving until you read this napkin. Fine. Okay, that's okay. That's too much. That's sufficient. Okay, but what about this? Nicole! Hey, I thought we were riding and sliding. What about Nicole? Well, I, I need to know her role. There is none. Well, Luke, if it's joint money, then I should acknowledge that and thank her the next time I see her. Because... You're not going to see her now. Can we just stop talking about this whole thing? Hey. Okay. But I insist on typing up something legal and binding for this loan. Okay, okay, I really just don't want to talk about this anymore. Okay. We'll dot the I's and cross the T's another day. Yes, we'll cross and dot. Okay, I just have to write down one more thing. What? What is so important now? You're welcome. To her credit, Lorelai wants to discuss an interest rate and payback terms, and she wants to make sure that Luke is comfortable with the details of the loan. Whereas Luke is shown as being like, I don't want to talk about this, this is not important, like, you'll pay me back, I trust you. And Lorelai's like, can we get it down on paper? I think this is a really interesting dynamic to display on TV because commonly in the personal finance world, you are told never lend money you can't afford to lose and also never lend money to friends and family because it complicates the dynamic of people that you see every day and that you love. Lorelai goes to Luke's diner every single day. Honestly, I don't know how much money Lorelai spent at Luke's diner, but I wanna say over the seven seasons and over the years that she was going while Rory was under 16, it's likely $30,000. I mean, really and truly, she's at that diner at least once a day, often twice a day. Is it possible for her to have spent $30,000 in let's say 12 years? Let's say in the first four years of Rory's life, she wasn't going out very much, but let's say over the last 12 years, plus the seven years of the show, could she have spent $30,000? I'm gonna say yes. Lorelai could spend. That is shown as one of her core defining money characteristics. Now, possibly the most interesting big money moment for me is not between Lorelai and her parents or Lorelai and Rory. It's actually between Luke and Taylor. So Luke owns Luke's diner and he lives in the apartment above it. And presumably he owns that. He owns both the diner and the apartment above it. Again, we never get clarification on that. Then one day Luke is out and he's trying to find a new apartment for him and his nephew Jess to live in. And he keeps finding out that Taylor, his town nemesis, owns a bunch of apartments throughout the town. So he confronts Taylor and turns out Taylor owns a bunch of buildings in town, which infuriates Luke. So truly in a fit of rage, he goes to the bank and he buys a building. I ran into Taylor at the market 
and I found out he owns the building that apartment was in. No way. That and several others all over town. That is so weird. He's systematically buying up the town. He's going to turn it into Taylorville, where everyone will wear cardigans and have the same grass height. <laughs> Do you want to sit down? And then he told me he's going to buy the building next to the diner, turn it into a plate shop for freaks who don't have enough brain power to collect stamps. I lost it. I can't picture that. I walked around in a blind rage. I was crazy. I bought one of those Belgian waffles with the ice cream dipped in chocolate. You ate that? No, I didn't eat it. Of course not. I'm upset, not suicidal. Right. I knew I just had to do something. I had your voice going round and round in my head. Yeah, it's kind of like the small world song. You take a chance, Luke. Make a move, Luke. Can't have a single bed, Luke. So I bought the building. You, you what? I went to the bank and got a cashier's check, signed the papers, and I bought the building. Wow. I am the building's owner. I heard. I own the building. This is crazy. First of all, that's not how buying a building works. <laughs> you have to get pre-approved for a loan. There's a bunch of paperwork. You don't just go to the bank and be like, I want to withdraw $100,000 and buy a building in cash. But also, the fact that Luke could make such an emotional decision and had the money to back it up, so interesting to me, which honestly makes me reconsider my point earlier of Lorelai borrowing $30,000 from him. Again, we as a viewer are not shown how much money Luke has until he rage buys this building. And then it's like, oh, Luke, are you sitting on a bunch of cash? Do you actually have a lot of money to go around giving multiple people in your life $30,000 loans? Because it kind of seems like it because you just bought a building at the drop of a hat. As someone who is a little bit petty myself, I love the idea of buying a building <laughs> to keep your nemesis from owning it and also to become your nemesis's landlord, which Luke does when Taylor opens his ice cream shop right next to Luke's diner in the building Luke owns. But I find this interesting because Luke uses money as a tool to help Lorelai and he also uses money as a tool to hurt Taylor. That's a very interesting dynamic on a show where we predominantly see people use money as a way to get people to do what they want. Richard and Emily obviously are our best example of this, but Logan, Rory's college boyfriend and potentially her one true love, is someone who uses money to get what he wants all the time. And the final big money moment that I am interested in is when Richard gives Lorelai a check for $75,000. I assume you're wondering why I asked you here. Not at all. Well, I have something for you. Is it a hat? No. Is it a purse? No. Of course. Lorelai. George Foreman Grill. When you were born, I decided to celebrate. So as soon as your mother went to sleep, I left the hospital, I called my business manager, and I made a real estate investment. You do know how to party, don't you? I made this investment in your name. Wow. Most people just buy a stuffed bear. This is better. I thought so. Anyhow, a little while ago, I got a letter from a lawyer who was representing the investment group, informing me that the government is building a road right through the middle of your investment. Sad. Which means that the complex has been sold, and all the investors will be receiving a check. Happy. Since you are one of the investors... I get a check? You get a check. <gasps> wow! That's... $75,000? Yes, it is. I get $75,000 for being born? I thought it would be a pleasant surprise. This is $75,000. 75... $75... Lorelai's thrilled. She makes a joke about buying a bunch of Jimmy Choo's. Do you have a pen? Why, yes, I do. $75,000. $75,000. Thousand dollars! Oh my God, that's like 150 pairs of Jimmy Choo's. What are Jimmy Choo's? Shoes. 150 pairs. That's it. <gasps> Dad, they're Jimmy Choo's. For seventy-five thousand dollars, you should be able to buy at least three or four hundred pairs of shoes. Not Jimmy Choo's. But that's ridiculous. You are not going to spend seventy-five thousand dollars on Jimmy Choo's when you could buy four hundred pairs of less prestigious, but I am sure equally stylish shoes. You will shop around first. Is that clear? Yes, sir. All right then. Settled but ultimately she chooses to use the bulk of that money to pay back Richard and Emily for the loan they gave her for Chilton. Now, understandably, Lorelai is very excited to pay back her parents. She hates being in debt. She hates owing her parents specifically. And she always said that the Chilton money would be a loan. She never, as an individual, expected that to be a gift from her parents. But the way that Emily reacts to Lorelai paying back the Chilton money is in my opinion, super unhinged because I am a certified Emily Gilmore hater, but it also plays into this dynamic between the three of them. Richard made the investment and gave Lorelai the money without 
telling Emily. Richard keeps a lot of information from Emily. Richard is never 100% transparent with Emily. When Lorelai tells them she is paying them back, she does so at their house to the both of them. And Richard gets angry at Lorelai for revealing that he gave her that money. He says, I told you to keep it a secret. And Lorelai says, no, you didn't which is true, he never told her that. But he's mad at Lorelai. Emily is mad at Lorelai, and Emily is also mad at Richard because Emily sees money as a tool to control people, and now she no longer has the debt, the Chilton debt, to hang over Lorelai's head and say, you owe me. You have to come to Friday night dinners because you owe me which Lorelai points out. She says, I'm not removing Friday night dinners from my life. I'm just removing the obligation for Friday night dinners, which sends Emily into like a fury and she storms out. Emily can't really relate to her daughter unless it's through the lens of control. And she uses money as that control. And Lorelai having grown up with that dynamic and continuing to have experienced that dynamic as an adult, sees money as an evil, basically. She wants the access to her parents' money when she's in trouble, but she doesn't actually really want a lot of money for herself. We don't really see Lorelai talk about how one of her dreams is to become rich or talking about her dreams through a financial lens. She mostly wants the life she already has, which is she wants to be like the cute, quirky, hot girl in Stars Hollow. She wants to be desired by men. She wants to be able to go to work every day and do a good job, but she doesn't really display ever a desire to be an extremely wealthy person. Something that kills me about this show is that Lorelai is presented as being very responsible, especially in earlier seasons. Lorelai is depicted as someone who has her life together. She's paying her bills on time. She's providing for her kids. She's an excellent boss. She's really good at her job. But when it comes to the Chilton money, we never get details on how Lorelai plans to pay that back. If Richard hadn't given her that $75,000 check, what was her plan for paying her parents back? We never see Lorelai talking about setting aside money, having a savings account specifically for paying back her parents. And in fact, we see that Lorelai has pretty shoddy financial habits. She eats out for almost every single meal. And while she owns her home, she doesn't seem to have emergency savings for her home as evidenced by the termite situation. And she shops way too much by her own admission. She loves to shop and she loves to spend money, which as a viewer leaves me with a lot of questions, predominantly, how do Lorelai and Rory afford their life? Like as a girly who has been low income, who has had to provide for myself off of $10,000 a year, $12,000 a year, $15,000 a year, I'm like, Lorelai, the numbers are not adding up, girly pop. How do Lorelai and Rory afford the way they eat? They are shown over and over again as eating a ton and eating very unhealthy processed foods. It's expensive to slowly write your insides, isn't it? and processed foods are notably more expensive than fresh fruit, fresh produce. They eat out at least breakfast every single day, and Lorelai often pops into Luke's or pops into Weston's for a coffee or a piece of cake or some sort of treat. It seems like while Lorelai thinks of herself as financially responsible, she and Rory are living paycheck to paycheck, which would make sense because every time Lorelai comes up against an expensive problem, she has to borrow money. Throughout the course of the show, we see Lorelai borrow money from Luke, her parents, and the bank. And more so with the question, how do they afford their life? They don't seem willing to make lifestyle changes. Now, I'm not saying that everyone needs to stay at home and just eat rice and beans and never buy avocado toast and that's why you can't afford a house. Obviously, small purchases every once in a while are not the reason that people can't retire or buy a house. But Lorelai and Rory don't make small purchases every once in a while. They make small purchases every day throughout the day. And they are seemingly completely unwilling to make lifestyle changes, which is the way that most of us regular working class and middle class people make financial change in our lives. Like we see Lorelai and Rory eat breakfast out every day. It's easy to say that that's probably $30 between the two of them every single day. $30 a day times 365 days a year is $10,950. It's not house buying money in 2024, but it actually is down payment money in the late 90s. And with Lorelai living her life this way, that's how Rory lives her life, right? That's her main point of inspiration and that's the main role model that she has. As Rory herself points out throughout the entire show, Lorelai is Rory's hero. But my ultimate inspiration comes from my best friend, the dazzling woman from whom I received my name and my life's blood, Lorelai Gilmore. As she guided me through these incredible 18 years, 
I don't know if she ever realized that the person I most wanted to be was her. And Rory always seems to have spending money, despite the fact that we never really see Rory work full time or over the long term. In high school, Rory doesn't have a job. She occasionally works at the Independence Inn for some spare spending money, but she doesn't have a consistent job. When she gets to Yale, she does spend a semester working as a card swiper at the dining hall. But again, we only see her do that for one semester. That's not a long-term job where she's had all four years of college. She has an unpaid internship at a newspaper in college. And we do see her work at the bookstore for like four seconds in SARS Hollow, where we are shown her actually spending her entire paycheck buying more books. But throughout the show, Rory always has money to go out to eat, to take the bus, to buy coffee, to buy her friends CDs or clothes. Rory always has spending money. And I don't know where it comes from. I have absolutely no idea how Rory has consistent spending money over seven seasons. So while Lorelai and Rory think of themselves as very middle class, they are not. And they're not good TV depictions of the middle class either. I would say that Roseanne, Shameless, and Malcolm in the Middle are much better depictions of lower middle class and outright poor people in the United States. Now I get that when it comes to TV, most people, including myself, want escapism or aspirationalism. So it makes sense that we don't have a ton of TV shows built around people who live in poverty in the United States. Gilmore Girls presents itself as a show that wants to have a fresh take on money and class in the United States and misses the mark every single time. Finally, we have to talk about generational wealth in this show because it is everywhere and it colors everything from day one. In the first episode when Lorelai goes to ask her parents for money for Chilton, she's able to do that because she has generational wealth. Lorelai is also set to inherit all of Richard and Emily's wealth. She is their only child and they do love her, albeit in a twisted way. So Lorelai always has this safety net, even as she rejects her family and as she rejects that life, she always knows in the back of her mind that that money is there and will be there for her in the future. And Lorelai never makes any kind of statement along the lines of, I plan to give up my trust fund or I won't, I'll be rejecting my parents' money. And even though we never get a net worth number out of Emily and Richard, they are shown as being, I would say probably they have a net worth north of $5 million. Richard makes multiple references to life insurance policies and investments throughout the show. Emily is able to spend lavishly. Really the only time Richard pushes back on Emily's spending is when she tries to timeshare a plane, which admittedly is hilarious. But that's really the only time that we see Richard try and put some sort of cap on Emily's spending, which leads me to believe that they are ultra high net worth individuals. And of course, there's Logan. Oh, Logan. I love you, I hate you, I do think you're the perfect boyfriend for Rory. Logan Huntsberger is introduced to us while Rory is at Yale, and he comes from an exceedingly wealthy family. A family that is presented as being significantly more wealthy than Emily and Richard. Consider the discrepancies, Emily. Well, that's what's confusing me. They both come from good families, they both have good values. Money doesn't seem to be an issue, we all have money. Frankly, Emily, there's your money, then there's our money. Oh, and our family has a lot of responsibilities that come with that, an image to maintain. In fact, Logan's family is so wealthy and so upper crust that they look down on Rory because she wants to be a working girl and in their family, women don't work. Now, Logan has a lot going on financially, like coming from a class perspective, Logan's got a lot to unpack, but Logan fully embraces his life of privilege. He's not ashamed of it, he's not embarrassed, and he uses his money to get what he wants, whether that be throwing the most amazing party that Yale has ever seen, whether that be jetting off to Vegas with his friends or planning life and death brigade events with a black Amex, like Logan has no problem spending his parents' money and he feels good about it. Unlike Rory, who refuses to accept the fact that she comes from an exceedingly privileged family and is exceedingly wealthy herself. And that dynamic comes to a head in my favorite big money moment of the whole show. Rory's in her senior year, her junior year at college, I think it's her senior year, fact check me in the comments, and she writes an article about a party that she attends, which is full of the elites, and she makes fun of them. I don't know what to say. Oh, yeah, I know the ending is a little convoluted, but I have it's some It's not ideas. convoluted. You made your feelings perfectly clear. What do you mean? Just that it must have been really hard for you at my party, surrounded by all those people with, how do you put it, 
You can no more imagine a world without trust funds than a world without water imported in Bali, of course. Oh, no, that was meant to be funny. It I... sounds like it was torturous being stuck there with these overprivileged sons and daughters of somebody who feel to grasp how out of touch they seem to those of us who don't have an errant domestic employee or construction problem on Beef Island. You're mad? You're damn right I'm mad. But you were making fun of these people all night. I was joking. I wasn't standing there judging everyone. I didn't judge everyone. The title of your article is Let Them Drink Cosmos. I was joking around with my girlfriend. I wasn't comparing a whole class of people to Marie Antoinette. I'm so sorry. I really didn't think that this would upset you. You didn't think it would upset me? No, no. I was just writing. I mean, I was worked up. I was mad at my mom. Maybe that kind of got into the piece somehow. But no, this was meant to be funny. I didn't think you would take it personally. I mean, you're totally different from these people. No, I'm not. You know what? I don't want to be. Logan. What? I'm a rich trust fund kid. I'm not ashamed of it. No, and you shouldn't be. That That's not what I meant. I mean, my point, or the point I was trying to make, was that people use connections to get ahead. Oh, give me a break. You act like making connections is something nefarious. It's not. It's just people meeting people. Well, it's certain people meeting certain people. It's not like anyone's meeting Joe Bus Driver. And you're Joe Bus Driver. Well, no, Exactly. But... I mean, where do you get off acting all morally superior? That is not what I intended to say at all. You clearly think you are? Why? Because you read Ironweed? Because you saw Norma Ray? Okay. Wake up, Rory. Whether you like it or not, you're one of us. <laughs> you went to prep school. You go to Yale. Your grandparents are building a whole damn astronomy building in your name. That is different, okay? It's not like I live off a $5 million trust fund my parents set up for me. Yeah, well, you're not exactly paying rent either. <sighs> Screw you, Logan. Oh my God, every time I rewatch this scene, I'm like, Rory, <laughs> get your head out of your butt. What are you talking about? When Logan says, well, you're not exactly paying rent. <laughs> Rory needed to hear it, bro. Rory needed to hear it. This I think is the most class aware moment of the entire show where someone from the 1% of the 1% says to the 1%, hey, you need to accept the truth about who you are and where you come from, which is the world of privilege and ease. Because Lorelai thinks of herself as working class, and because Rory grew up in Stars Hollow instead of Hartford or New York, she thinks of herself as working class. But the truth is both of them, Lorelai and Rory, are upper middle class to upper class because of their generational wealth. I mean, Rory has access to two trust funds, one from her great grandmother, one from her parents, and she should have access to the one from her great grandmother when she's 25, just three years after she graduated graduates college. Rory will never, ever, ever have to work for money. She will never be reliant on a paycheck. And really at no point in her upbringing did Rory have to work for money. Did Rory have to worry about money? Rory has led an incredibly privileged life. And in this argument, Logan points that out. And he's like, yeah, me too, bud. Nothing to be ashamed of. And Rory struggles to accept that. Unfortunately, we never really come back to this dynamic. Later on, Logan apologizes, but he's like, continue to stay in this apartment and I'll pay rent while I jet off to London to go work for one of my dad's newspapers. I really, I'm not sure what he does in London, but I really wish that we had seen more of Rory being forced to confront her class privilege because I think that would have been a much more interesting show, especially because Rory is the great white hope of the Gilmores, right? She is the future of the Gilmore clan. And I think that's really a missed opportunity because the show does such a good job of poor portraying messed up relationships to money where people won't acknowledge their money or people won't acknowledge that they're using money against other people. And I think it would have been very cool to take kind of the legacy of Richard and Emily and Lorelai and have it play out in Rory where she grapples with the awareness of money in her life. But instead, Rory continues to just sort of live in the dark. After this argument with Logan, the class awareness is never brought up ever again. So as you can see, there's a lot to unpack when it comes to money in the Gilmore Girls universe. And I know I came down pretty hard on the show at times in this video, and especially Emily, but I love this show in so many ways, and I'm actually so grateful for this depiction of money and class on TV because it gives viewers a lot to think about. And it does deal with money in a much more upfront way than most of our television shows. I think that's a really important thing for us to have in a country that is as class divided and as economically divided as the United States is. So I am dying to hear from y'all. Let me know. Who's your favorite character in Gilmore Girls? Do you also hate Emily Gilmore? Are you an Emily Gilmore fan? What do you think about money in the Gilmore Girls universe? Let me know, give this video a thumbs up, and hit subscribe so you never miss a video.